Greetings, and welcome to Unveiling a Titan, Part 6, New Evidence. I hope you're all well and surviving our collective institutionalized weirdness. The world's begun to resemble an open-air asylum, and the word institutionalized seems appropriate to describe these trying times. I don't know about you, but I found it fascinating to see that the people who've made the most sense throughout our last year of twilight zonification are the supposed crazies. You know, the quote-unquote conspiracy theorists, or as I've taken to calling them, the paying attentionists. It's been 18 months since I released part 5 of this series, and a lot has happened in that time. I've made additional discoveries regarding Mont Go, which I'll share today, and I'll also address a couple of criticisms that have been raised regarding the research. Many of you who've taken the time to watch parts 1 through 5 of this series have found the evidence that I've presented to be quite compelling. Many have reached out, expressing gratitude for what I've shared, and several have told me that the videos have been nothing short of life-changing, altering their perceptions of the world and strengthening their connections to both nature and the Creator. At the other end of the spectrum are those who've rejected the research out of hand, sometimes expressing concerns that what I presented is potentially dangerous because it'll lead the gullible astray and they'll fall prey to what the skeptics consider to be nothing more than a misguided delusion. In a free-thinking society, the questioning of narratives and conclusions, as well as the critical examination of evidence, are valued intellectual exercises. Sadly, we live in an era where many, if not most, are threatened by truly open-minded inquiry. They retreat instead to the safety of the status quo, but in so doing, they become victims of groupthink and unwitting devotees to the church of scientism. I'm not suggesting we should all open our minds so far that our brains fall out, but like muscles that go unused, our brains can also atrophy. It comes down to use it or lose it. And if we don't take the time to learn to spot fallacious reasoning, then we become like lemmings rushing towards the cliff's edge and criticizing any who dare to go in the opposite direction. Indigenous peoples in many parts of the world have no difficulty accepting the idea that the stones were once part of living creatures both great and small. But to us first world moderns, such ideas are the stuff of myth and fairy tale. Even so, growing numbers of independent researchers around the world are beginning to acknowledge the wisdom of these supposed primitives and engage in honest inquiry. In so doing, many, like myself, are coming to the conclusion that much of what we are taught about the physical nature of this world is inaccurate. Whether it is through the result of parenting, religion, or culture, each of us has been raised within a particular system of thought, and all too often we are oblivious to its shortcomings. I call this paradigm blindness. A paradigm is defined as a set of assumptions, concepts, values, and practices that constitute a way of viewing reality for the community that shares them, especially in an intellectual discipline. It's important to understand that nowhere in this definition does it say that a paradigm requires a basis in truth. For a paradigm to serve us as an accurate roadmap, it must be based on empirical evidence, experimentation, logic, reproducibility, scalability, and internal consistency. At their worst, flawed paradigms can exist as a form of thought virus. Free will requires discernment, but how can we properly discern if our beliefs are based on unproven assumptions? If we are unwilling to turn a critical eye on our own beliefs and humble ourselves to the possibility that we may be wrong, we become little more than non-player characters with pre-programmed responses. Four years ago, I began to question the unquestionables, and since that time I've learned more about the physical world than I had in all of the preceding years combined. It's incredibly humbling when you permit yourself to question long-held beliefs, only to discover that much of what you had taken for granted as proven fact may not actually have been proven at all. I've mentioned in previous videos that the majority of those who've levied criticisms on my channel have dismissed the findings with little more than a hand wave. Because they believe that what I've presented couldn't possibly be true, they feel there's simply no need to investigate further. Only a handful of critics have taken the time to actually review the research I've presented or to pose intelligent questions. 
Often they raise questions that I've already addressed in the videos, and their criticisms make it glaringly obvious that they haven't even bothered to review the findings. Throughout the first five parts of this series, I presented a total of 50 specific anatomical and histological correlations between the rocky structures of the mountain Mont Go and vertebrate anatomy. Today I'll add a few new, very interesting items to that list. But first I'd like to address a couple of the criticisms that initially proved quite difficult for me to explain away. Several people in the comment threads noted that the head of the mountain, when viewed from the side, showed clear signs of sedimentary layering. In their minds, this single fact was enough to debunk the entire theory, and they felt no need to dive deeper into the remainder of the research. It was a conundrum for me. I had to admit that I couldn't explain the occurrence, and I had to agree that it made no sense that a titan would petrify in layers. Still, Given the very large number of anatomical coincidences that I'd already found, I wasn't ready to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And if we're going to be intellectually honest when attempting to apply the scientific method, we can't simply discard information that conflicts with our pet theories. It took nearly a year before it dawned on me that skull bones, specifically the parietal and temporal bones, might actually grow in this fashion. I looked for images that would demonstrate the grain of the skull bones and came across this. Right away, it occurred to me that there might indeed be a layering to the structure of the bone. It wasn't long before I found additional images that demonstrated that skull bones form like rings of a tree from the apex of the skull downward. These rings, when viewed from the side, would appear as horizontal lines. Obviously, this isn't proof that Montco was once a titan, but it does allow for the possibility that what we call sedimentary layering could have formed instead through biological growth. Another criticism came from someone who claimed to have first-hand experience with geological field work in this region of Spain. He too mentioned the sedimentary layering as a glaring hole in my theory, but also added that the limestone I claimed to be titan bone had instead formed just as mainstream geology tells us, through the compression of shells, mollusks, skeletons, and coral. Though he conceded that he had never actually visited Mont Co, he had on numerous occasions seen examples of this sort of limestone with his own eyes, and told me condescendingly that if I had just taken the time to look through a microscope as he had done, I would have found the fragmented remains of smaller creatures. A quick image search appeared to confirm his claims. Many shell and bone fragments can be seen in limestone with the naked eye, I knew that if he was correct about the limestone on and around Mont Go, it would debunk my theory that the stones were fragmented pieces of titan bone. The cortical and trabecular bone findings figured prominently in my coincidence list, and I was aware that if I were to find fragments of bone or shell in the stone, it would mean that I would have to throw out a dozen or so of the items on my coincidence list. I originally presented my findings on the subject of cortical and trabecular bone in detail in the fourth Unveiling a Titan video, but here's a brief recap. If we look at the long bones, we've got this compact bone area here, which you can see better here, which is in layers, and I'll show another picture in a moment that, that illustrates that from a different angle. But inside is the sponges bone filled with all kinds of blood vessels. This is where the, the blood is produced, the red blood cells of the body. Your bone marrow is there, big portion of your immune system as well. This is looking at the cross section of the compact bone. It looks like layers of a tree growing outward. Yeah. So this is trabecular bone. If we look here, this is looking at it under a microscope. And you can see it's fractal in nature. You've got bigger and bigger holes going down to smaller and smaller and smaller holes. This is a pelvic bone, and you can see here when the outer layer is broken away, you get the sponges bone exposed. And here it is with blood. And cross-section with the blood remaining, but all of the water is gone, obviously. So keep this image in mind when I start to show you some of these rocks in a moment. Most of the specimens that I'll be showing you today are going to be from this region of the plateau. And we talked before, I'll mention it again in a little bit, but this, this area here, this is what all of the earth looks like when you 
scratch at the surface. Any any rock that you lift up, you got this reddish colored earth. Mainstream geology would be telling you that these channels are formed by water moving through and slowly eroding and creating larger and larger fissures. So all across the plateau are, are rocks that look like this. They're either filled with reddish earth or the earth is completely gone and you just have a nice channel there. This is also found all over the plateau. This is iron ore and you can see here it's stuck to the sides of the rock and all of these rocks are just filled with iron ore on the outside or in these channels and it clumps up. If we look at the constitution of blood, you've got the red blood cells making up 45% and then plasma, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So this is iron ore and iron ore is found all over the plana. And you can see here the rich red color of the earth below. And you can see a specimen up close. I think that all these little cracks and everything, to me this looks very biological. Doesn't doesn't look like something that was formed by, by chance. You've got all these different passages going different directions. And you can see how this iron loves to stick to the sides of the of the limestone. And then inevitably there are these channels that are filled with combinations of red earth and chunks of this little iron ore. Now again, ask yourself if these look like fissures that are formed from water going through cracks, or if this looks more biological in nature. This is one of the fields that I showed before from above, right here. You can see the trees and the the rich red color of the soil. And this is a real fascinating specimen because you can see down here this chunk has broken away exposing the inside and you can see here that where that rock has broken away there's literally red earth oozing out of channels. Another angle. And here we're looking down into larger blood vessels and if you look each of these larger spaces here break off into smaller channels. So this is exactly what I would expect to find with the fractal nature of blood vessels. After years of hiking this mountain, especially these last few with new eyes, I've examined these stones very closely on many occasions. Never have I seen any signs of smaller creatures embedded in or composing the rock. I reviewed the footage I'd already gathered, zooming in on pictures I'd taken to get a closer look. There were no signs of smaller fragments of bone. On my next hike, I got up close and examined numerous examples with the naked eye, again finding no hint of what he had claimed I would see. And so I ordered a 60x microscope, which could attach to my phone, and went back out into the field. I thought surely that 60x magnification would be enough to spot shells or skeletal fragments. I have to admit, I was rather nervous when I first began to use the microscope. Could I have really missed something so simple? And now I'm on the plana, the plateau, right in front of this beauty. This is Mont Go from the front. Uh, right at that section, that's the synclinal. That's these curved layers of strata where there was likely a big collapse. And I don't know if you can see it in the silhouette of Mont Go, but right there. There. Is the uh, is where I believe the the breathing hole was.
and uh, and I've talked about this in the fourth video, right in front of that, that whole um, slope going downward that's lighter colored is, uh, is all fragments of this trabecular bone. which the whole plana here, as you can see, is littered with these kinds of rock. And they're, uh, they've got all kinds of different holes going through them in different directions and different sizes. Their surfaces are smooth and they have all kinds of little lines going in different directions that look a lot like little blood vessels. We're going to be going up a little further, and there's some really good examples of what I'm talking about. Well, here's one right here. So this is actually a prime example. You've got these different holes, and then you can see these lines, and then there's the, the iron ore, which I believe is the, the blood, and then those channels go in, and then they get smaller and smaller. And... Um, can see here on the back side that there's there's an accumulation of this iron ore right inside of the channel. That's a just a clump of iron right there. Um, and then a little hole going in there. So I believe this is trabecular bone, and those are blood vessels and blood. So I'm going to look at this up close now with the microscope and see if there's any hint. I mean, you can see as I get in close, there's no hint of, of any kind of shells, coral, mollusk, any of it. And I would expect there to be little tiny ones sticking out. Um, here is a little chip missing, and it looks like it came from right there. So even that looked like it might have been a... It's just a piece of the... You can see the, the continuation there of the line right there. So that broke off. But everything else, it's, it's totally smooth, except when you go down to one of the sides, you'll see that it's, it's broken. Whoops. <clears throat> it's broken, like you can see the fragments under here and the red. So that that's that portion is broken, but this this is intact and smooth. And I think these mountains all over they were covered in this because everywhere you look there are terraces, and the terraces are made of these these chunks of limestone that that look like they're made of rocks like this, you know, and bigger. Um, and this limestone that literally the terraces are on all of the mountains in this entire region and and it used to used to cover the mountains i believe but then it broke off into you know smaller and smaller pieces or it was specifically broken off in order to create these terraces and i'll show footage of that but the terraces are are uh, everywhere and uh that all that rock which is easily visible i'll show it with google earth all that rock had to have come from somewhere and i think it was these that have been broken up and uh, you can see just how how uh, biological and organic like those are blood vessels right and then as you move in closer you see all this micro micro lines going in all kinds of different directions just like you'd expect blood vessels to do and then the iron ore etc cetera, etc cetera. so let's take a look at this rock with um with a microscope and see see what it looks like. All right, so I picked this rock as a sample to uh, start with because it really embodies everything that I've been showing with both the trabecular and the cortical bone. You have examples of, of large, what I would call blood vessels, smaller ones. You've got these lines of iron ore stretching all throughout and the, the quartz crystal as well, so the, the blood and the plasma 
we've even got some fractures here. The top is, is smooth and has this biological look and we'll be looking at the side in a moment. Uh, and initially I just went into one of the, the, the general areas that didn't really have anything distinct. And uh, this is what I found. So you can see that uh, there isn't any hint of, of any shell or coral or mollusk. Now this is one of the little iron channels and a little bit of a look at the, the quartz lines. And again, a, an iron ore channel. This is 60x magnification. You can see as it starts to, to break down, this is, this. if you rub this with your finger, it's like, it's, it's like dirt, like dust. So now I'm going to go in on, on the, uh, the white here. More of the iron ore channels. And this is really looking at the quartz now. And then for these next few pictures, I go in on this area because my thought was, okay, well, if this is eroded, maybe it's rubbed away any traces of, um, of shell, coral, mollusk, uh, but they should be visible here in a, in a fracture. And there is nothing. Realizing that 60x magnification would not be enough to prove unequivocally that there were no traces of smaller creatures embedded in the stone, I decided to look into a higher quality microscope. After a quick search online, I found an amazing Wi-Fi enabled microscope capable of 1000x magnification. A week later, it arrived, and I was able to repeat the tests. These are the results. This is what I would call the, the cortical bones. I would expect it to be a lot more compact, except for some larger blood vessels. Um, and of course the micro blood vessels, but you can see there's some crystal there, some quartz accumulations, and there's also a little bit of iron ore right in the same spot. So that's the, the plasma and the red blood cells. Um, the top has that that biological look to it. So I'm gonna be looking at, at the top. I'm gonna to be looking at the sides. Okay, so just to give you an idea of how amazing this microscope is, these are some hairs on my forearm. <laughs> um, and this is a, a little, it was, it was a little flower bud that was about one millimeter in diameter. And this is the wing of a gnat. So you can see just how amazing this little Wi-Fi microscope is. If you got kids, uh, this is a wonderful way to get them interested in the microscopic realm. This is just looking at um, one of the gray general areas. Now, initially when I was looking at these yellow areas with the naked eye, I was wondering if it was a trace of some kind of a, a sea creature and uh, it wasn't, and I'll show you what they were in a moment. This is the iron ore, and the iron is mixed with the yellow kind of goldish color, and then you've got black as well, so I'm thinking it's a blend of, of the venous blood and the, the red blood. And here you can start to see what these, these yellow things are. These are actual, like a mossy growth that's on the rock, and you can see they're kind of mixed in eaten away at the the mineral content and this is what I was talking about this this blend of what I believe is the venous blood with the the red blood
And now we're getting into quartz crystal, the lines. This is the gray area. And you see more of those little yellow things, which we'll get a close up of in a moment. So this is looking at 500 to X and then you can bump it up to 1000 X, which I may have already done here. Again, no traces, even at 500 and 1000 X of any coral mollusk shell. And this is what these things look like up close. These are growing on the rock. And look at that. <laughs> amazing what's there in the microscopic realm that we never even think about or see. And just to, oh, this is, this is the quartz lines getting in close. You can see it's even got a shimmer and a shine to it. So going back and thinking about trabecular bone, this is how it looks under a microscope. Very similar to this, if you ask me. So uh, that that official narrative of the of the formation of limestone, at, the, at least this particular kind of limestone, um, doesn't really hold up to scrutiny or a 1000x microscope. So as you can see, even at higher magnifications, there are no signs whatsoever of bone or shell fragments as we saw in the limestone photos I showed you before, which are clearly filled with fragments of smaller creatures. My suspicion is that limestone can indeed form in sedimentary layers as mainstream geology teaches us. But the limestone on and around Mont Go is clearly not formed in the same fashion. And based on the branching fractal openings which I believe to be blood vessels, along with the reddish earth, iron ore, and quartz crystal found in and attached to the limestone, I stand by my theory that these are actually pieces of trabecular bone that grew inside the body of a titan. Okay, so let's talk about plasma now. If we look at the composition of blood, 91% of blood is made of water. And if we remove the water, what remains are 7% proteins and other solutes. So if we, if we consider this 7% here, this is what's really giving the plasma its yellow color. It's made of albumin. And when you think albumin, think egg white. It's got this yellow, fatty kind of a quality to it. And it's the fluid that the red blood cells are floating around in. Egg white and these other substances here are composed of what are known as long chain fatty acids. And that's what gives it the yellowish color. And if you remove all of the water from that, it's crystalline in nature. This is, this is what human albumin looks like when all the water is removed. So this is what albumin looks like under a microscope. Now take a look at this. Does that look familiar? How about now? How about now? So this is a crystalline structure and it's found all over the plana. So here you got a nice combination of the, the red of the blood vessels with the iron rich and then the plasma has also stuck to the out, outer side of the rock. Another angle of the same rock. So this is another specimen that I found. These kinds of crystals are found all over the plateau. I think this is a combination of the yellowish albumin mixed with the reddish blood. And so that's why it's got this dark brown reddish color.
And here you can see the exact same thing attached to a rock. So you've got the, the iron rich blood and then you have this plasma stuck to the side just like an egg white stuck to something. This is a beautiful crystal that I found and it's huge. That's the back side of it. So there's a lot less of this on the planet. I think it's because people have collected the crystals because they're beautiful and they've taken them home over the years. Perhaps they were removed for industrial purposes, but there's a ton of it up there. Okay, so rock, rock, bone, rock, bone. Or is it all bone? If you've already seen the fifth Unveiling a Titan video, then you saw the incredible discovery I shared, which appears to be the remains of an eyeball in the eye socket of Montgo. I've made an additional discovery, which ties in, which I'll share in a moment. But first, let's look at some footage up in the eye, taken by my friend John. So now we're, um, we're on the back side of that, that cresting, rocky structure that I was showing before. And if you think about the structure of the eyeball, it's white, and that's known as the sclera, and that's made of a fatty structure. And like I said before, when, uh, when my theory is that when fat is petrified, then it turns to a crystalline structure, quartz. And what we see here on the entire back side of that structure is that there's about a 10 inch thick layer of crystal that's on top of another another form and this goes all the way around and then uh, has a, a channel that builds that goes back into this portion of the the eye socket and uh, actually builds the optic nerve so oh, can you can, show us yeah so everything you see here is all that that 10 inch thick crystalline layer and that's the, that's the cresting structure going going up and uh, these channels that are going down here this this is another what's known as suture where the two, the bones meet in the in the eye socket and if you look in vertebrates you have the optic fissure which is where the optic nerve goes which we'll see in a moment and then you have these other fissures that uh, are are places where the the bones meet in sutures, and those go down into the sinus passages. And if you follow these caves down and go in through smaller channels, that actually enters into a giant cavern in there that could very well have been the sinuses and maybe somehow leads to the brain. I haven't expl explored every, every, everything there was to explore, but here you can see the, the channels going in there and there. These are the, the vascularity of the, of the eye, I believe, the, the blood vessels. And uh, as we come up here, now we're on the, the back portion. And you see this structure of the, the cave coming down this way. And from above, you can really see that, that this is the optic nerve that's forming. And you can see from here, looking down, that it's following straight back, and you can get around the other side and see the same structure from the other side. And uh, so, all throughout, all throughout this whole section, you have this crystalline covering, and then just channels going in in different places. And then, if you look back down that way. This, is, this has been cut away, but I believe that this was one continuous piece and it's all covered in quartz crystal yeah. going all the way back and that's all quartz in there as well. So that whole section is going down and straight back exactly where the optic nerve should be going. Crystal. 
and even over here. This is all crystal. You can see the pattern. And just the, the structure, how it holds the weights, it looks more bio, bio, how do you say it? biological? Biological. Yeah. biological. It doesn't look like it's just been forced together. You know, it looks like it's grown in this in this shape. So here's, here's the other side of the optic nerve structure, and then more of the, the channels going down. And, and this angle is exactly the angle that you see in the eye sockets as well. So. What were you saying that that was over there? Oh yeah, so over there, so if you think of the eye socket having six or seven bones that constructs the eye socket, you got, you got one bone up here and another bone here that build the, the inner portion of the eye. And then we already talked about the infraorbital foramen, which is here, here on an elephant. And if it's tilted back, that would be the, the holes going that way. But what you also have are these two bones that meet. And I can't remember the names of the bones, uh, maxilla and something else, but those bones meet at, at a suture and you can see that crack that's going up. And I show in the second video how that matches the location and it also matches the shape of an elephant skull for the inner portion of the eye socket. So it's not just that there's an overlap of, of rock there that's exactly where the suture would be. It also has the same form. A lot of coincidences. Sure is. How many coincidences does it take before it starts to be an emerging pattern? A few months back, my friend Howard and I were hiking on the north side of the mountain, and we came across a couple of caves that were just begging to be explored. Keeping in mind my theory that fat and blood plasma both can turn to quartz when petrified. Take a look at this footage. So we're on the north side of Monko, and uh, high up you can see the town down below there. And uh, entered in and climbed up into this area here, which goes back here. And you can see it's just this crystal layer that goes back into here still there that's how crystalline and then this continues to, into another cave which we're gonna go out in a moment goes back that way i don't know how far because we haven't been there yet and then you can see this crystal layer and it just continues it's it's definitely like like a fatty you know maybe art arterial kind of a layer um and uh, there, there you can see it as well. Oh no, no, not there. So let's just see where this goes. That goes back. And then it appears to maybe stop. I don't have any gear, so I'm not gonna go spelunking. But wow, what, is, what a formation. So here we go, through here. beautiful you can see the trees are growing to kind of cover and hide the entry to this other cave and look at this that that crystalline layer followed all the way through this whole channel that's all one long crystal that's connected to some other kind of stone which appears to be limestone so this is totally consistent with the uh the kinds of things that i that i discussed in the fourth and fifth unveiling a titan series Let's see these cracks that's the crystalline layer continuing and up there is a good friend and check this out wow it looks oh it's like it's just magical up here, it really is. <sighs> Looking up. Oh, wow. 
What a beautiful day. It was raining a little bit earlier today, but it cleared up. Wow, that's a big one. There's a tree in there. Look at this. Oh my gosh. Growing right out of the side of the mountain, huh? There's loads of channels up here. Huh. So, going every which way. Every way. Okay. Goes down there. There's a tree growing out the side of the mountain. It's so beautiful. I've never seen that before. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, it's absolutely like, awesome. It's like seeing something at Angkor Wat. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> Not got, that I've ever been there, but it's such an amazing there. little tree like this. Come See on. all the channels up there as well. What a crazy... I feel like I'm in Angle, but it's absolutely <laughs> amazing. I live here. And it's epic. It feels safe here. It's got a great energy. This would be an awesome spot to camp. You've got all the floor flattened. Built a little bit of wall. <laughs> oh, wow. How about that, huh? <laughs> okay, so here we're looking back into another section of the of the eye socket, and it, going down. You know, if if these were channels that were formed by by water flow, for example, you would expect things to be smooth. But instead, it's the opposite. You see these structures that appear to be something that, that's grown. And if you get down in here, you can see that there's really a, a tissue-like quality to it. So I, my theory is that, you know, this would be artery vein passageway. Another extremely interesting discovery I recently made came when I finally recognized something that had been hiding for years in plain sight. When looking at the mountains in this region in person, or on Google Earth, some of which may also be Titan candidates, there are countless parallel lines that can be seen. At first glance, one might conclude that these lines are the sedimentary layers that we've already discussed, but this is not the case. The lines you see here are actually Moorish agricultural terraces, which were built, according to the official story, back when the Moors were in control of the Iberian Peninsula between the 8th and 15th centuries. These terraces serve many functions, preventing topsoil erosion, capturing water, and providing a home to numerous crops such as almond, olive, and a variety of fruit trees. I was always amazed at the scope of these terraces. But it wasn't until a forest fire a few years ago exposed a section that had been completely covered by vegetation that I finally realized how utterly comprehensive they are. Titan country. Not a single Just person saw... Here. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Just saw this cave for the first time today. Curious what that looks like inside. Sounds like a frog body 
AP7 there. That yeah, it's just the above the highway. Yeah. And look at those terraces. Right up to the top. Everywhere. I mean, Everywhere. Even where you don't think they are, they're there. They're there. There's a there there. I mean, every hillside has got those terraces on. Every every single mountain. Every single mountain or mound or hill. They've utilized the side of it. And when it burns, it exposes it and you see it. But where the vegetation is, you don't notice it so much. But they literally made this whole region. I, I wonder how much of the, the rest of Spain looks like this. They are literally everywhere. Virtually every mountain in this region is covered almost entirely with these terraces. The vast majority of them are no longer even being used. This region is incredibly lush, even today, but it's hard to fathom how it all must have looked during Moorish or Roman times when this region was in its heyday. I believe the earth was vastly more populated by creatures of all kinds in the ancient world. This would also account for the mind-boggling quantity of petrified organs that I've presented in my videos. In the 13th century, Dante wrote about flocks of birds so great that they could block out the light of the sun. When I lived in Rome, I used to watch the murmuring of the starlings at sunset above the Vatican City. It was an incredible sight to behold. Once, from my eighth floor apartment in Rome, I saw what I can only describe as a river of birds flying by. The river was 50 to 100 birds wide, and it flew by unbroken for several minutes before the last stragglers picked up the tail end. Now imagine a murmuring a hundred or a thousand times larger. Anyway, back to the terraces and how they tie in to Titanology. The thing that's important to understand is that the rocks that make up these terraces are all built from the broken fragments of what were once larger continuous pieces of limestone. You can see it here. Notice the different sizes of the holes which I consider to be vascularity. Many of these pieces have one or more edges that are unbroken. This is what the unbroken limestone looks like. Does it remind you of anything? Come back to this spot that I've, I've wanted to uh, investigate a number of times. So you can see here, there's a, there's a layer that comes down and underneath there's a lot of reddish earth in there. And then you can see the same in these areas here. And clearly that could have been deposited by wind or rain or, you know, some kind of major flooding. But what I've seen on many occasions is that underneath this stone, when it's broken open, that there are channels going all kinds of different directions that couldn't possibly have been filled by some kind of flow. And I hypothesize that, that this has a lot more to do with this having once been flesh of different types, blood, bone, perhaps skin. Here you can see some quartz crystal accumulations, which I theorize is petrified blood plasma. Talked about that in detail in the fourth petrified, or the um, fourth unveiling a titan video. So now, given that the terraces stretch across the entire region, try for a moment to imagine how Mont Go and the other mountains in the region would have appeared if this sea of limestone had remained unbroken. Would Mont Go have looked even more like an elephant? Remember the broken rock I showed with red earth oozing out of the exposed channels? What if the people who broke up the outer layer of limestone did so not only to build the terraces, but also to expose the red earth trapped within? In our bodies, blood is the vehicle by which our nutrients are distributed to our cells. So it would be safe to say that 
Titan blood would have provided the terrace builders with extremely fertile soil once exposed. From what I can tell, the exact same materials have been used to build the star forts in this region. The walls and their points are made of solid limestone, or what I consider to be non-vascular cortical bone. The mortar and the filler for the walls appears to be a combination of crushed limestone mixed with the reddish earth, or from a titanology perspective, a mix of titan blood and bone. Added to that is a scattering of smaller, smooth stones, the petrified organs of smaller creatures mixed in for good measure. Fee, fi, fo, fum. If the Titans truly were once grinding up humans to make their bread, then the payback must have been sweet. One more interesting thing to note about the star forts is that they've been built on solid limestone bedrock. So here, this is, you know, where you see once again, they're constantly building right on the, you know, if that's, if this is Titan, then, then it's placed right on top of it, and that's why this would be so solid. Yeah. But either way, that looks like vascularity. Yeah, it's just like the larger opening is breaking off and the smaller opening is going in all directions. I don't know how you know, just typical water erosion can account for something like that. Nope. Um, it doesn't make any sense. And sometimes they're, you know, wide and they're, they're circular and they're deep and they, you know, they're channels that go through. Yeah, and they, they don't, and they, they, they wind. And they so wind, yeah. Water, it would be, it would, wouldn't it be cutting a straight line? Exactly. It wouldn't be cutting perfectly round, curving lines. How, no. how does it do that? Yeah, you know? exactly. Okay, go. So, this, I, I just find this really fascinating. This is the grout between these stones. It's like, it almost looks organic, it's got all these swirls, but, but this is some kind of a substrate that they've created, and it's lasted for, we don't know how long, <laughs> a long time. It does look unusual, and I've never seen anything like it actually. And it's all rested upon this, which I believe is Titan, because you can see the vascularity and it's limestone, but if you look down here, you've got crystalline plasma and you've got iron. So all three of these things that I talk about. In, Crystalline in plasma fourth. and iron yeah. and the vascularity of the rock. Many have hypothesized that they were built for mining purposes. But what were they mining? The bodies of titans, perhaps? Maybe it's no accident that mining terminology borrows from anatomical terms and that gold runs in veins. Could it be that artesian water, as Roger Spur has suggested, flows through channels that were once Titan arteries? So, if Titans did exist, then how big did they get? Anyone who spent any time looking into these subjects on YouTube has likely come across one of the many videos that Roger Spur has made examining what he claims is a 900-mile-long dragon in the Sahara Desert. Others have spotted what appear to be plumed huge dragons in other parts of the world, and my friend Mike found this spot in the Pacific, a mere 1,500 miles long. How creatures of such vast size could possibly have lived on a 25,000-mile spinning ball is a question I'll leave to Roger to answer. Personally, I believe there's a fractal nature to reality, and if Montgo really was a three-mile-long titan, then we appear to be the next fractal level down, just little ants by comparison. So I have no problem with the idea that there may have been a time before Montgo when creatures were nearly the size of continents, a level up fractally, so to speak. Does that sound a bit too far-fetched for you? Well then check this short video out. This was made by Ian David Harris, who has a channel with the same name. After watching my Unveiling a Titan series, he realized that he had seen similar rocky structures in Thailand, where he lives but on a much larger scale than Mont Go. Take a look and decide for yourself if he might be on to something.
After watching his videos, I have to say that his histological analysis of the rocky structures of Thailand appeared to dovetail perfectly with my views on Titanology. Fascinating, is it not? Well, that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you've not seen parts 1 through 5 already, take the time to do so. I believe you'll find it worth your while. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. And a huge thank you to all of you who've taken the time to post words of encouragement and those few who have donated for the research. It makes it all worthwhile. Until next time, take care. Don't let the BS artists keep you down. And remember, keep your heart soft. They work better that way. The whole thing it unwinds. Behold the great deception. Traversing throughout time. If there's a grip upon your mind Cause at the mere suggestion It leaves you all entwined Searching round for curvature In fragments of a plane No matter where I let my head turn Everything, it looks the same Shackles 
Have you been numbed into complacent? Bread and circus to the end. It's time to claim your mental freedom. You know it's up to you, my friend. Searching around for curvature In fragments of a plane No matter where I let my head turn Everything, it looks the same are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. A mirage. A mirage. 